My name is Jeremy Haidt. I'm currently one of the fellows in neurointerventional radiology, and I'll describe what that is in just a minute. And I'll be staying on uh, Stanford as staff next year, so I'll be around for hopefully quite a long time. So a little bit of uh, background about me. I trained actually here at Stanford. I did an MD and a PhD here at Stanford, ended in 2008. And then I decided the weather was too nice. I needed to harden myself up, so I went to Boston. I did an internship in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then I did my radiology residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, and then my wife was sick of shoveling all the snow and decided that actually the weather is better here. So we came back here, and we've been here for two more years uh, while I've been doing my fellowship. So it's good to be back in California, and I want to talk to you about a topic that's very important for our field. And by way of introduction to neurointerventional radiology, it sounds like a mouthful. My wife still doesn't think I have a real job because it sounds futuristic, and it kind of is. But basically what it is is we are the specialists of the blood vessels of the brain and spine, and most of what we do is minimally invasive surgery in the brain through inside of blood vessels. And I'll show you how that pertains to stroke um, as we talk about uh, stroke later today. So I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm a fellow so I don't have any money either. Um, so what we'll talk about tonight, a little bit of background about what uh, an ischemic stroke is. I'll talk about what it is, what causes it, and a little bit about the biology of how we think about stroke in terms of treating it. And then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we image stroke. That, that's become a very important topic and very important in how we decide who we can take for a procedure that uh, we perform as neurointerventionalists talk about what those procedures are currently. It's a very exciting time to be a neurointerventionalist, and then talk about and speculate a little bit about what the future might hold uh, for endovascular stroke treatment. So let's start off by talking about what is ischemic stroke. Well, this is a picture many of you may have seen before. It's very popular and put out by the American Heart Association. And I like it because it's a very nice summary of what a patient having a stroke might look like. This is a gentleman who's trying to smile, and what you can see is that his smile is asymmetric. This side looks normal. He's got a good grin. His cheek is coming up, but this side he has a droop. This cheek is not moving upward. His eye is a little bit droopy. And moreover, if this were a very dramatic stroke, you would find that he has profound weakness in his right arm, his right leg. His sensation on the right side of his body may be affected. These are very profound neurologic symptoms. And just to keep you straight and going forward, we think about stroke in opposites. So this patient where all the symptoms are on the right side of his body has a problem on the left side of his brain. Now, patients with these symptoms can be very severe like that or less severe, but overall in this country, stroke every year affects 800,000 people. So it's a very big problem for our medical system. 140,000 of those people will die. That's a very high mortality rate and is the leading cause of disability in this country. So it's a big financial impact to our healthcare system as well. The expenditures um, that the US spends treating and caring for patients with stroke exceed $73 billion a year. So it's a big problem. So those are the symptoms that you might see. There are other variations of that, but that's sort of a good overall picture. But what causes that? Well, a good way to think about stroke is an analogy to something most of you are probably familiar with, which is a heart attack. When you have a heart attack, you block an artery going to the heart. Well, similarly, when you have a stroke, it's a problem with getting blood flow to the brain. And we think about it as something happens very rapidly, and it's usually a blood clot that blocks a major blood vessel in the brain or on the way up to the brain. And this is a nice schematic from a recent review in the literature. And what you see here is there are blood vessels in our neck that run up toward the brain. This is the internal carotid artery. And then they turn, they have a very tortuous course, and then this right here represents a small blood clot blocking a major artery in the brain called the middle cerebral artery, or MCA. The MCA provides blood flow to around 80% of the cerebral hemispheres, and most large strokes affect this blood vessel. So in the patient I just showed you, he would have a blockage in the left middle cerebral artery, which would account for his symptoms, including the right-sided weakness, right-sided facial droop. So now I want to jump forward to try to thinking about, we see what the blood vessel looks like, but what's going on in this patient's head? And I've made some images to try to schematize what this is. So these are images just from an MRI, but I've kind of color coded them to help us think about conceptually what's going on in the brain. Normally, we're all sitting here, we have good blood flow to our brains. If you interrupt that blood flow, the effects are very immediate. You can think of a stroke as an immediate symptom. You're doing fine, suddenly you're very weak. It's a, it happens like that. And there's kind of two things that can happen to the brain when you don't get enough blood flow. 
One is that the tissue can die very rapidly. Neurons do not tolerate the lack of blood flow for very long. And if that happens, you get dead tissue. But not everything that's downstream of the blocked artery dies right away. Kind of like if you're driving on a highway and there's an accident, if you have the right app, you can get off and kind of go around the back streets and get back on the highway and keep going. The brain has a way to reroute blood to areas that aren't getting enough blood flow. But if that route takes too long, it's not enough to keep the tissue alive. But you have another whole area of tissue that's at risk of going on to die if something's not done to restore blood flow to the brain. And in the medical literature, we've termed these two areas core and penumbra. Core refers to the core infarction that happens in a stroke. That's dead tissue. We think of it as irreversibly damaged. It doesn't get better. It doesn't come back. By contrast, the penumbra refers to the tissue that's at risk of injury, but it's not dead yet. It's not functioning normally. If we can restore the blood flow to the brain, we think we can save the penumbra. We spend a lot of time and appropriate energy in imaging these two areas because it makes tremendous impact, uh, impact as I'll tell you later, in how we can treat patients with stroke. So at Stanford, we've been a leader in some of the advanced imaging that images core and penumbra. And here's one example from a recent patient. This is a patient who's coming in with a stroke. This is an MRI sequence called the diffusion weighted sequence. And what this assesses is the movement of water. And when brain tissue dies, water doesn't move. And you can take a picture of that. And right here in the brain, this is a stroke. It's a relatively small stroke. And now in the same patient, we have a way to quantitatively assess the blood flow up to the brain by injecting a label that you can see by MRI. And you can see that although the patient has a relatively small stroke of core infarction that's there, there's a large amount of territory that's not getting enough blood flow and likely functioning poorly, which is the patient's penumbra. So let's go back to an image that looks like this. This is a patient that's having a stroke. And we can see that, let's say, this part is core. It's infarcted. We're not going to get that amount of tissue back. However, this part of the brain might leave the patients with relatively less profound symptoms. However, there's also this area of penumbra that, if that is not saved, results in much worse symptoms. If we're able to reperfuse the brain, meaning restore the blood flow, then everything that's blue is saved. It goes back to normal. And we're left with the same size of core infarction that the patient came in with. That's what we want to do as physicians, because that's giving the patient the best chance at having a good outcome. By contrast, if we aren't able to open the blood vessel that's blocked going to the brain and there's no reperfusion, the tissue that is the penumbra will eventually go on and infarct, and you'll have a larger core infarction. And as the amount of brain tissue that dies increases in size, so do the consequences. So in thinking about that, I think you can probably understand that reperfusion is really the goal of all stroke therapy. We work very rapidly through both medical treatments and endovascular treatments that I'll describe in a bit to get the blood vessel open in order to minimize the amount of injury that a brain sustains. Let me show you a few examples just to illustrate these points. This is from a patient that I took care of, a 69-year-old woman who was out with some friends when she very suddenly developed weakness in her left arm and a droop in her left face. She came right into Stanford. She was bought by her friends. She had a head CT scan that really looked very normal. There was no evidence of a large infarction here. There's no evidence of overt injury. She got perfusion imaging to assess what the penumbra is. And you can see she has a very large amount of tissue that is at risk of infarction. We also are able to image the blood vessels non-invasively. This is a CT angiogram. And what you can see is the normal side of the brain. This is the middle cerebral artery in white. And if you look on the other side, it starts off fine, but there's a hole right there. That's a blood clot. So that's the blood clot that's partially blocking this artery. And the patient does not have very many blood vessels going to this part of the brain. Without blood flow in that part of the brain, she has this large penumbra. So this is a patient that you can help, because she has not had a big stroke here yet of core infarction. But if we don't get that blood vessel open, she's in trouble. So she was given a medication called TPA, which is tissue plasminogen activator. It's a clot-busting medication. And literally in front of your eyes, she started moving the left arm. She regained her strength quite dramatically. She then got an MRI scan around an hour later. 
And an MRI is better at showing where the actual core infarction is. And she had a very small core infarction. This is less than a milliliter in volume. It's very tiny. Her perfusion had normalized, except in the area immediately around the stroke, which we expect to see. And her blood vessel is now open. The medication worked. And she made a great outcome. Here's another patient that I took care of. A 68-year-old gentleman who came in with right-sided weakness and had a very small stroke on an MRI scan. You can barely even see it. It's happening so quickly. This is a patient that we took for endovascular stroke therapy, and we were able to find the blocked artery in the brain. And I'll describe this later, but this is an angiogram where we've injected a black, con a black dye, looks black by x-ray. And what we see is that there's nothing here where there should be a lot of blood vessels. This is where the middle cerebral artery should be and the arrow denotes the blockage. We were able to get the blood clot out, restore all this blood flow, and the patient was left with basically the same size stroke that he came in with. Again, that's what you want to do. Get the blood flow to the brain back, minimize the damage so it doesn't get bigger. This gentleman also made an excellent recovery. Here's a different patient. This is a little bit bigger core infarction on an MRI, but you can see it's still not that big relative to the size of the brain. This is another patient that was brought to our endovascular suite for uh, endovascular stroke therapy. And this was done before I arrived here when some of the technology was older. And again, you can see not a lot of blood vessels here where the middle cerebral artery should be, and there's a blockage. This just stops. It should go like that. So the doctors worked their best. They worked very hard. They could not get this open despite everything that they did. And the consequences of that for this patient was that the patient went on to have a much larger stroke and a much worse clinical outcome. So those are three examples of why you want to have the blood vessel open, because it really does maximize the chance of having a good recovery from a stroke. So in going forward, keep in mind that what we're going to be talking about are ways to reperfuse the brain. Get the blood vessel open, restore the blood flow, minimize the size of the stroke. And again, I've been speaking a lot about we want to do this quickly. This is a widely cited uh, paper in our literature from Dr. Saver at UCLA, where he calculated well, how much injury do you get in the brain on a per minute basis, on a per stroke basis? And a widely quoted number is this one. Per minute, if you don't restore blood flow, you lose, lose around 2 million neurons. That's a lot. So you really want to get that blood vessel open. And I was alarmed to see that one stroke accelerates your aging by around 36 years. So these are a little bit of extrapolation, because um, he's doing this on just some rough math. but. The point is that you want to get blood vessel open because there are real effects to not doing so in terms of how a patient will do. OK, so what can we do to help patients with a stroke? Well, we have a few options. In 1995, there was a very large study published in the England Journal of Medicine showing that intravenous administration of the clot-busting medication, TPA, was very effective in taking care of patients with stroke. OK, TPA again stands for tissue plasminogen activator. It's injected through an IV, and it acts to find a blood clot and actively dissolve it. So patients that got this drug compared to a control group of patients that were just managed medically, 30% of the patients that got the drug had a favorable outcome and were functionally independent. That's very good data. And this was a, just a landslide in terms of stroke therapy. It was a real game changer at the time. Because prior to that, all you could do were sort of measures to try to increase the blood pressure, make sure you try to get more blood flow that way. But you weren't really doing anything to actively get rid of the blood clot. Now, the downside of TPA is that the data shows there's a very limited time window in which this is helpful. The original trial said you need to give the medication within three hours. And follow-up studies have said you need to get it into the patient within four and a half hours. Many patients with strokes do not get to the hospital in time to get treated with TPA. In fact, it's only around 7 to 10 percent of patients now that are even eligible for TPA. These are very small numbers in the context of what I showed you demographically goes on in the country earlier. So that's a problem. That being said, if you can get to the hospital, it's a good thing. So Subsequent to that, in 1999, there was another trial called the PROACT-2 trial from Japan. And this trial showed that there's another option. If you're able to get a catheter, which is just a hollow plastic tube, from inside the arteries all the way up into the arteries in the brain where the blood clot is, and then directly deliver a similar clot-busting medication, you can make an improvement in how the patients will do. And importantly, they extended the time window to six hours. So this actually increases the number of patients that you can offer a treatment to pretty significantly. 
That being said, these early studies were also plagued with high rates of complications. A lot of these patients developed bleeding in the brain, and that was a significant concern in terms of how you care for people, and it uh, is something that still limited the use of this therapy broadly. Now, more recently, there's been a technique called mechanical thrombectomy, and this is a technique that's also an endovascular therapy from inside blood vessels, and the goal of this is to mechanically remove the clot. And you can do that by either putting a device up to grab the clot and pull it out, putting a device up to grab the clot and suck it out like a vacuum. But these newer devices have actually begun to be a game changer, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And more importantly, the recent trials have extended the window in which these devices can be used from six hours to eight hours. And many people, including even us, are taking this beyond eight hours now and getting very good results. So, we're moving in the right direction in terms of being able to fight this clock and being able to help people, but we've got to know who will really benefit from what we do, and that's where imaging has played a big role. And one of the things we're likely to see going forward is that imaging could be a way to stop the clock. Wouldn't it be nice if a patient woke up with a stroke? We have no idea what, kind of, what time it started. Maybe it happened five minutes before they woke up. Maybe it happened two hours after they went to bed, and it's done. But what if you had a way to sort of sort that out and say, you know what, they're eligible for treatment? Well, people are working on ways to use advanced imaging, particularly places like Stanford, to say this is a patient who still can be helped even though we don't know when the stroke started. And I expect that this will be an exciting area to watch in the years to come. Okay, so how do we use imaging to kind of fight this clock and decide who is a good patient to take to the cath lab that will benefit from our therapy? Well, again, remember what we're trying to do is reperfuse the brain and minimize the amount of injury. And in thinking about who's a good patient to put through a procedure to try to reperfuse the brain, there are three criteria. You want to have a patient with a relatively small core, a small amount of infarction. This patient should also have a large amount of tissue at risk of infarction if we are not successful in getting the blood vessel open. It's that mismatch that's really critical. And lastly, there's got to be a blood clot that we can get to. There's a big difference in a blood clot that's at the base of the skull where the arteries are just coming into the brain in terms of being able to access it to something that's way up near the top of the brain. The technical um, difficulties of getting further out and practicality is, is very different. Now, so we've got to have a way to answer these three questions for every patient that we're going to consider taking to the cath lab for a procedure. And at Stanford, we are very good at doing this with two different ways of advanced imaging. We can use MRI and we can use CT, and there are reasons for each um, that I'm happy to talk about with you guys later. But both of these can basically get at the same points. And MRI is very good at finding how big is the area of infarction. It's very good at finding how big is the penumbra, again, by injecting a dye that changes how the MRI senses it, and you can quantitatively assess blood flow to each side of the brain. And it's very good at finding whether there's a vessel that's missing. Similarly, CT is very good at finding how early, uh, early signs of a stroke, not as good as MRI, but good enough. It's equally good at perfusion in terms of assessing the size of the penumbra, and it's excellent at finding a cutoff in a vessel that represents the location of the blood clot. So any patient that's going to be considered for stroke therapy, by and large, should have these three questions answered by CT or MRI scan, and that's really becoming the standard of care nationally. Okay. So now we know how to pick the patients that we think we can help. We know that we can, we can get them up and do something about it. So what exactly can we do? Well, endovascular stroke therapy is very, very exciting right now. And that's because in the last five months, almost five months, it's almost May, there have now been five randomized control trials, all published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing a remarkable benefit to endovascular stroke therapy compared to medical management alone. So I want to put one data slide up. So I apologize if it's too much, but I think this is a really nice way to illustrate this. Uh, this slide's inspired by Dr. Albers, one of our stroke neurologists, who gave an excellent talk about this recently. And what you're looking at here on the y-axis, this is the percentage of patients with a good outcome after a stroke. The medical literature, we usually define a good outcome as someone who is functionally independent and with minimal symptoms, because that's a patient that is overall still has a very good quality of life and maybe even a normal quality of life and is also someone who uh, is not 
stuck, you know, needing assistance and so on and so forth. So obviously that's what you want to be, someone who still has a very good quality of life. And then on the x-axis axis here, excuse me, these are the names of the five trials. You can see they give them kind of goofy names. And in each trial, there's both a medical arm and there's an endovascular arm. All the patients that got endovascular therapy got equal medical therapy. So this is added benefit to what we normally do for patients. And you can see, if you look at the patients who underwent endovascular stroke therapy, it's really remarkable how much better they can do if you select the patients properly by the criteria I discussed earlier. 33% good outcome to 19, this was the first uh, study that came out. 53% of patients treated have a good outcome compared to 30. 44, 60, 71, these are excellent, excellent numbers. And this makes a big, big difference for each one of these patients. And even on a bigger scale, it's a massive difference to our society, both in how people are doing, how their health is, the financial impact of stroke. These are steps in the right direction. So again, what is happening to patients that are in this red group that were brought for a procedure? Well, as I discussed earlier, there's three options. We can give TPA, that clot-busting medication, directly into the clot to break it apart. We can put a big catheter up to the clot and try to suck it out. Or we can use a device that looks like this. This has been termed a stentriever. These were initially developed as stents for narrowing in the blood vessels, and they weren't very good for that. But what we found by accident in testing them is that they're very good at grabbing blood clots and pulling them back out. So as long as you can leave the stent attached to something you can pull, you can use it to get a blood clot out of a vessel. So all of these things I'm talking about now require things to be inside an artery that's way up here in your brain. But how do you get it up there? Well, everything we do has to have a little bit of road mapping and driving on the highway. Basically, we put our equipment into an artery in the leg. Again, these are largely catheters, which are just long, hollow plastic tubes. And then we use x-rays to navigate them from an artery in the leg all the way backwards into the neck, up into the arteries in the brain. So it's a pretty big distance. I'm a short guy, but you can imagine a taller person. That's a long way to go. And it's really a testament to material science that we're able to do this. When I first got interested in this field, these procedures were not only extremely difficult and in many cases not possible, they took hours to do. These procedures now can be done in 20 minutes. I mean, they can be very, very fast. So there's been a remarkable advancement in catheter technology, biomaterials, such that you can have a wire in your hand and by turning it a little bit, you can manipulate a device that's all the way up in the brain. That's really an amazing feat, and it's really made a big difference for patients. So what does this look like? Well, here's a patient that we took care of, and I thought it would be interesting to show you guys how we get a device up there and sort of the curly course cue that's required. So this is a short movie. This is a catheter here that's all the way up in the internal carotid artery in the skull. And then there's a smaller catheter called the microcatheter that's been put through this that winds its way up into the artery in the brain right here. Here's the tip of the microcatheter. The blood clot that we're going after is right here. So if you watch, you can see this is the device. This is a stentriever getting pushed up, and it goes through the microcatheter. Look at the turns this thing has to make to get all the way out up into the brain. Again, that's really remarkable. It's navigating. 180 degree turns, 360 degree turns, by pushing something down in the leg. And once we get the device all the way up there, we can basically unsheath it, expose the scent, and then we're able to grip the clot. After we do that, you can pull the clot out. This is the same patient. I'm going to warn you, this is a patient who was awake, which we do on purpose. I'm happy to talk about that later, and very confused. So you're going to see the head moving around a lot. He was very comfortable. We don't let our patients hurt, but it's going to look funny. This is what happens when we start to pull the blood clot out. So first thing we do is we're moving this big sucking catheter up along this stent treever right here. And you can see the patient's kind of chit-chatting away, moving around, very confused. And now you're going to see that we're going to start to pull the stent treever device into the catheter. Here it comes. We're moving along, moving along, and almost there. Pop. We got it out. Blood clot's gone. Patient's doing OK. So that's sort of what this looks like. And you can kind of appreciate the difficulty of doing it, but also the fact that we can do it. And it's really, I think, quite remarkable. All right, so I want to show you a few success stories. These are all patients that I've taken care of during my fellowship. This first one is a 63-year-old surfer girl. You heard both the age and the description correctly. 
she was actually running at the gym on the treadmill, which she still does every day, extremely active, very fit, when she collapsed. She was brought to an outside hospital. They thought she was having a stroke. They gave her TPA to try to break up the blood clot, and they asked us if there was anything else we can do. She was put on a helicopter, flown to Stanford, and as soon as she landed on the roof, she came right down to an MRI scanner where our whole team was waiting, and she had this scan. Her diffusion-weighted imaging shows she has a very, very small core infarction. It's tiny. You can barely even see it. You might even miss it. There's an arrow to help. But look at her perfusion. Her penumbra is unbelievably large. This is her dominant hemisphere. It's actually on the left side. These are as if you're looking at the feet of the patient. But this is a remarkable penumbra. This is a great patient that you can take to the cath lab and really help. And we know where the blood clot is. Here's the normal side. Look at all these blood vessels. This is the medial cerebral artery. And look at the lack of them on this side. And this is actually the blood clot itself. You can see the blood clot using a different MRI sequence. So we've got a patient with a small existing stroke, a lot of tissue at risk, and a blood clot that we can get to. We go straight to the cath lab. So here we are, first picture we've taken. The catheter is now in the artery in the neck. We've injected the contrast dye, which is black. It winds its way up, and boom, stops. This is where the blood clot is. There should be blood vessels all the way up here, and they're not. So we know that we got to get to there. We go further up into the arteries in the brain. We've got an aspiration catheter here. We've got a stentriever across the area of the blood clot. We suck, we pull, <coughs> and we're able to open up the blood vessel. This is a great result. Here's the blood clot. Okay. This patient did great. She was in the hospital for two days, I went home. She's still running every day. This is a different patient we took care of. This is a triathlete. Not all strokes happen in patients who are in their 60s or older. He's 50. He was training for a triathlon running when he collapsed. Again, was brought to an outside hospital, was again given TPA. He got to the hospital quickly. Same thing, we were called put him on a helicopter, flew him to Stanford, and he went straight to the MRI scan. This patient's also had a relatively small stroke, bigger than the last one that I showed you, but this is still quite small, has a large amount of brain tissue at risk of infarcting further if we don't get the blood vessel open. And again, like the last patient, the normal side, you can see a middle cerebral artery, and look, there's a complete absence of the middle cerebral artery on this side. He comes straight up to the cath lab, this is an image that was taken 40 minutes after arriving at Stanford, 20 minutes of which were the MRI scan. So pretty quick. And what you can see is a little bit of a different picture than what I showed you last time. And let me kind of show you what's going on. This is looking at the side of the head. This other picture here is looking at the front of the head. All of the contrast dye we've injected is coming up. And instead of going out to this part of the brain, it's actually shooting backwards and going to these blood vessels in the back of the brain. And that's because there's a blood clot right here where all of the blood vessels that are right here are not filling. This is a very bad stroke to have. This is a blood clot you want to get out. Here's another image kind of outlining the length of this blood clot. This was almost two centimeters long. Okay. So we were able to go across it with our equipment, grab it, pull it out, and look at the difference. Restored the blood flow. This was one pull. This whole procedure took 32 minutes. Here's the blood clot. So look what happened after that. This is how he started. His stroke got a little bit bigger, but not too much. There are a little bit of small areas of bleeding in here, which is something that can happen. Here's what the perfusion looked like, completely normal after we opened up the blood vessel. And here's what his blood vessels looked like on the MRI scan. Again, there was nothing here, and now it's normal. And I had to put this one, this is just a great picture. This is a uh, reconstructed image of the blood vessels from his MRI when he came in. And again, here's the blood clot right here. And there it is now. And he also did very well. One more example. This is a 64-year-old gentleman uh, who came in, kind of subtle symptoms, nausea, some kind of funny vision changes. And I showed this case to kind of harken back to earlier in that why don't all patients get to the hospital quickly? Sometimes you don't know you're having a stroke. I mean, these are symptoms you've all probably had. Hey, blurry vision. My wife called me today. She said her eyes were a little blurry. She has bad allergies. Sometimes we don't feel well. But you could be missing something that's a big problem. And that amount of confusion is to be completely expected. And it's going to limit some people getting to the hospital. 
This patient did get to the hospital because the nausea was quite bad. And there's a very, very small stroke in the back part of the brain. This is the pons. This is a very important part of your brain. This is the part of the brain that controls your level of arousal, consciousness, basic functions of breathing and being alive. And this patient, different to what I've showed you before, have, has a blockage in the artery in the back of the brain. This is the basilar artery, arguably the most important artery in your body. And there's a blood clot right at the top of it that's blocking part of the posterior cerebral artery, which goes toward the back of the brain. This patient was brought right up to the cath lab. And here's the picture. You kind of see this little fuzzy interface here? That's the contrast flowing around the clot into the normal side here. But there should be something that looks like this on this side, and there's not. So the blood clot is blocking the top of this artery and the artery that goes to, in this case, it's the right side. It's opposite. So we were able to get the blood clot out, open the patient up. Here's the blood clot. And again, the patient did very, very well. OK. okay. So those are some examples of what we can do now. And again, it's a very exciting time. Just to give you some numbers, um, I mentioned that the drug TPA, when it was approved in 30% of patients, was able to open up these type of clots. And 30% of patients had a good functionally independent outcome. We looked at the numbers that have been shown for the recent trials for endovascular stroke therapy, showing an excellent outcome in anywhere from 40 to 70% of patients. And in terms of how often we're able to get the blood uh, those blood clots out and the blood vessel open, we're successful between 80 and 85% of the time, and sometimes even higher than that. So we're very good at getting blood clots out now. So that's important to keep in mind, because what does that mean for going forward? Well, I think we're going to see a few things. There's going to be better neuroimaging triage of patients. And a large part of this, I think, is going to be to try to stop the clock. Again, it would be great if we can just have a standard way to scan people, know whether they're going to benefit from what we can do, and also what they're likely to benefit from. I expect there'll be some further improvements in the devices that we can use to do the mechanical thrombectomy procedures. There's been a very rapid advancement already, and I think they can still do better, and they will. And I think there's now going to be a lot more emphasis on timeliness of these procedures. We want to be able to get patients into a hospital, get the imaging to make sure that they're the right patient to help, and get them up to the procedure room as expeditiously as possible in order to try to help them. Those are sort of, I think, obvious next steps. And then I think just it would be fun to speculate for a minute about, well, what can a place like Stanford do? And this is what I hope that we'll be starting to see in the coming probably 10 years. But we can get catheters to places very quickly that really is unprecedented. And it's a really unique opportunity to start to explore, well, can we do something to change the biology of a stroke itself and the after effects? What about stem cell therapies? What if you could deliver a stem cell, maybe not a neuronal stem cell, maybe a, a cell that supports the environment that the neurons need to be nourished, and sort of change the inflammatory surroundings that those cells are bathed in, in the setting of a stroke? That could potentially be a very exciting treatment that might really alter the course of even a patient that's already had a larger stroke. What about the delivery of biologic therapies? What we do right now is we give medications. It's very effective. We've been doing it for years. But we also are now in the era where if we sequence the genome. I was in graduate school when that happened. And we have a better understanding of the cellular signaling that goes on in the setting of stroke. Well, what if we can start to deliver biologic therapies? You can deliver RNA that can change gene expression. What if you can do that to calm down inflammation, promote the survival of neurons? Can you deliver these things through nanoparticles? Can you package different drugs in nanoparticles to you know, promote neuronal survival? These are all very interesting questions. And I think we're likely to see many of these technologies start to be ex uh, explored and exploited. And I hope that Stanford will be on the leading edge of it. And with the resources we have, I think that we will. So just by way of summary, stroke, it's a big health problem. It's caused by blockage of an artery going in the brain or going up to the brain. We went over some of the demographic numbers. 800,000 strokes in this country alone a year. It's a big public health problem, and it's a big problem for many patients and many families. And we also talked a little bit about some of the recent emerging technologies in endovascular stroke therapy and the differences that they're making for patients. And with these changes that are already happening, I know at Stanford we're certainly going to start taking one blood clot out at a time. Each patient, we're going to do it. We're going to do our best to help them. And there are many other hospitals that are doing this. And if we keep doing this, this can really chip away at those big numbers. And that's what we're all about. 
If you have friends, if you're near people that you see something like this, this is put out by the American Heart Association. The acronym is FAST. Do they have a facial droop? Do they have arm weakness? Do they have speech difficulty? Those can be symptoms of a stroke that may be overlooked. And if you see them, time to call 911. So think about that. You may be a person who spots that. It can happen in a restaurant. Someone may look to be drunk, and it's a stroke. So keep these things in mind, because you may be able to help someone just by having heard about it. OK. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Sir. Uh, we talked about all these clocks. Why do, you, why do you get the clocks in the first place? A very good question. So my job is to get the clot out. The question is, wh where do the clots come from? So that's a big part of taking care of patients with strokes. Um, when you come to a place like Stanford, you can't just have a couple of people involved in the care of the patient. You need a whole host of expert people. You need neurologists. You need neurointerventionists. You need speech therapists. You need intensivists. You need medical doctors. You need speech therapists. And much of what happens after we get the blood clot out is getting at your question, why is it there? The most common cause is an arrhythmia in the heart. Atrial fibrillation is the number one cause of strokes that we take care of. When the heart normally beats like this, atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia where it's irregular. It just beats in an erratic and unpredictable manner. When that happens, there are pockets of the heart where blood is not moving through because it's getting squished out in a repeated pattern. As blood pools, it forms a clot. So there can be little blood clots that hide in the heart, and those can break off and fly up and block an artery in the, vein, uh, in the brain. That's the most common cause. Uh, another cause is disease in the arteries in the neck. There can be atherosclerotic disease and narrowing that are very inflammatory. You can get a blood clot that forms on it that can fly up and block an artery in the brain. A similar process can happen in the brain itself. Good question. The person with the basilar um, artery problem, because it was in the back of their neck when they were nauseated, did they also have vertigo? No. This patient did not. Many of the patients do. That's a very common presentation. And again, you can imagine how that's a problem. A lot of patients have vertigo. A lot of patients feel nauseous. Good question. She was asking about whether there's vertigo from a basilar stroke. Okay. The question is, why do these patients have arrhythmias? The w examples I showed you were, in general, young or healthy people. Many of the patients we take care of are not. Okay. Smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, hy uh, I said high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, having your cholesterol be out of whack. These are the major risk factors for stroke. The vast majority of patients have that situation, which leads to heart disease and arrhythmias. You can also have an arrhythmia just because it's the way you were born or because you've had some small damage at some point in your heart that's created an arrhythmia focus. And those can be things that are just bad luck. It's a good question. So the question is, well, what is the blood clot made out of? And there's kind of two different things. Um, one is that it can be made out of largely fibrin, which is sort of a blood breakdown type of product. And that's the type of clot that you typically get from the heart. Some clots are made out of uh, platelets, and those are more of the inflammatory type of clots that come from an atherosclerotic plaque that's very irritating, a lot of inflammatory change, and a platelet plug forms there and flies off. Uh, you can even get other more goofy types of clots. You can get fat. Patients with trauma can have injury to bones, and fat can fly through and block an artery in the vein. So the question is, if you live far away from a place like Stanford, how do you get to a place like Stanford that can help you? How do you get a helicopter to come here? So we have a few ways. Number one is we actually have a network. So we have relationships with hospitals that people know if a stroke comes into the emergency department, they can call us. Our doctors will be on the phone within five minutes. We'll listen to the story, understand what's going on. If it sounds like it's someone we can help, we can dispatch the helicopter and get them here. Um, that's a good question. I've taken care of two patients from Eureka that were put on a small medical transport plane, landed at Moffitt or at San Jose, and then were helicoptered up. It's a longer transport time. We were able to help both of them, and they both actually did very, very well. The unpredictability comes in that each patient's physiology is different. That transport time, the patients we took care of, that penumbra didn't, didn't shrink, and the core infarct didn't grow. You need to be able to make sure that the brain that's at risk of dying doesn't die as you're getting a patient here. 
And that's another big part of why we image patients when they get here. Um, and then one more quick comment about stroke centers. Not all stroke centers are stroke centers. So there's comprehensive stroke centers and there are stroke centers. So Stanford is a comprehensive stroke center. It's actually the first comprehensive stroke center. And that, <coughs> excuse me, denotes, losing my voice. That denotes uh, a very high level of care. It means there's a neurointerventionist on call 24 seven. There are neurocritical care doctors 24 seven, neurosurgeons 24 seven. It takes a lot of resources uh, to be a comprehensive stroke center. And there are actually relatively few of those in the area. So the question is, most of what I've talked about is actual treatment of the clot when patients show up with a stroke. And, but what about preventing a stroke? Um, and similar to what we were talking about uh, from the other gentleman here, being healthy is the most important thing. You know, don't smoke. Get your blood pressure under control. If you have diabetes, make sure your glucose is well managed. Make sure your lipids are low. If you have atrial fibrillation, make sure that you are put on a medication if it's appropriate when you talk to your doctor to prevent a blood clot from forming in your heart. Coumadin, there are now newer generation medications that do the same thing. Those are important discussions to have because a large amount of those efforts can prevent something like a stroke. We take care of a lot of patients that have atrial fibrillation and they actually knew they had it, but for one reason or another, either they thought, oh, I don't need to take the medication, or they're in financial hardship and couldn't afford the medication, and they come in with strokes just because they weren't able to be on the medication they need. How does aspirin work at helping the stroke? So we like aspirin. Uh, it's a very good drug. So aspirin inhibits platelets, uh, which is very good for blood vessel health. It's an anti-inflammatory. So a lot of stroke patients um, will benefit from aspirin. That's another drug that's been tried and true over the years. It's a very good preventative medicine. In the actual acute stroke, once it's happened, there's not a large role for it in terms of breaking up the blood clot that caused the stroke. It's really a preventative medication, and it's a very good one. The question is whether you should be on a baby dose uh, aspirin or a full dose aspirin. Different physicians have different opinions. I think many people now uh, would tell you that the amount of inhibition of your platelets, whether you take a baby aspirin or a full dose, is very similar, and I would say that. So the question is, I showed two examples of patients that were exercising when they had their strokes, and it's not to discourage you all from exercising. What's good for your blood vessels is good for preventing a stroke. So um, there is a theoretical question about when you're exercising, you get a catecholamine surge, which is some of the hormones that help rev your body up for exercise. Those can affect your heart rate. So there's a theoretical um, possibility that as you're exercising, you may trip yourself into an irregular heart rate or by pumping the heart more may theoretically cause a blood clot to be more likely to break off. That being said, there's no good evidence for that. It's all hand-waving explanations. Most of the patients that we take care of are not these examples, um, but I find it neat to see people who are very active have bad luck and that do very well afterwards. Okay, so the question is, patients that get TPA, it's effective in one type of stroke, and I'll clarify that in a minute, 30% of the time, and what are the risks of using it? So most of the strokes that I've been talking about today are what we call large vessel occlusion strokes, meaning you're blocking the internal carotid artery, the middle cerebral artery, very close to the skull base. Those are notoriously tough clots for TPA, and the 30% reflects what are the chances of TPA breaking up a clot in those locations. Now, if you have a smaller stroke because the blockage is further out, meaning you probably have a small blood clot that blocks something out here, TPA actually is more likely to help you in that situation but it's really these big vessel clots that it just is not that effective. So people have started to look at this. There are a few ideas out there. If an artery this close to the skull is blocked, it's a big clot, which means there's a lot more surface area to dissolve, which means if you give a drug through an IV, it's got to coat all that surface area to break it up, which is a taller order. That's one explanation. There have been studies to look at the length of the blood clot and how well it responds to TPA. There are very good studies showing that if a blood clot is longer than eight millimeters, it actually responds very poorly to TPA. So people are looking at that as a criteria for uh, selection for stroke therapy. One of the studies I showed you actually had that as a criteria. And then your second part of your question was, what is the risk of TPA? So the risk of TPA is actually the same risk that we tell patients. And the major risk I would tell you is causing bleeding in the brain. One of the examples I showed you, the patient after we pulled the blood clot out had a little bit of bleeding in the brain. That can certainly happen for a couple of reasons. One is that you have a whole area of brain that's not been getting a lot of blood flow. The blood vessels in that brain volume are damaged, they're leaky. 
So if suddenly you open up the blood vessel and get a lot of blood pressure coming back into it, a little bit of blood can leak out. And that's what happened to the gentleman I showed you. However, you can also be unlucky and have a massive hemorrhage. So that's the concern. It's a small number of patients, but there is a real risk of both with TPA and what we do of causing bleeding in the brain that can frankly be catastrophic. So very rarely. We've been lucky at Stanford. Actually, our numbers are very low for that. And we think it's because of the imaging selection that we do. But you definitely will see it. Yeah, so the question is, if you are a patient who's had a TIA, uh, does that in any way preclude you for being a candidate for endovascular stroke therapy? So is that correct? TIA. So a TIA is a transient ischemic attack. Okay, and this is something that's a precursor or something that's a high risk sign for a stroke that could happen. And usually what that means is, I can't connect a box, um, is that it's telling you that you have a situation where there's something wrong and your body's giving you a warning sign. TI can be something like your arm is weak and it concerns you, you notice it, but it gets better after a few seconds or even a couple of minutes. You may have a hard time speaking for a few minutes, but then it gets better. That can be many things. That could be a seizure. It can be a TIA. It could even be a small stroke. But if you have those kind of symptoms, you need to be evaluated by a physician because that can be a warning sign of something bigger to come. Um, if you have that, that doesn't preclude you from being treated by what we do. So the question is, um, there are many things that can cause strokes that we talked about and some of the risk factors. What about if you have a problem in your carotid artery and not just your heart, and what can you do about that? How do you know about it? So there are classic symptoms uh, that can tip you off that you have a problem with your carotid artery. Um, a very common one is something called amaurosis fugax, and that's described as you suddenly have a veil that drops across your eye and you lose vision in one eye, and then it recovers. That's a very common sign of a problem with your carotid artery on the same side where your visual symptoms are. If you have that, that's concerning, you need to be evaluated. Um, the way you deal with narrowing in the neck, uh, there are many things. You do medical management, so aspirin is good. Other antiplatelet medications are very good to help with that. If the narrowing is too severe and you're having a symptom, you need to get it fixed. Two ways to fix the narrowing are surgery, to kind of go in, kind of roto rooter it out, clean it up, sew it back together. That's called a carotid endarterectomy. It's a very good treatment. Patients that get it can do very, very well. And the second thing is you can put a stent in it, a carotid stent. And that's a procedure that we also do. And that's where you come from inside the blood vessels and you basically put a little strut to open up the narrowing. And those are good treatments for problems in the neck. Um, some patients will have foggy thinking. Some patients will get lightheaded. They'll get weakness when they're dehydrated. There are many symptoms that you can. Yeah, so the question is, are there tests you can do to look for narrowing in the blood vessels in the neck? There are. Um, I would say for in general, for any medical test, it should be indicated. Because if you go looking for things and you don't have a symptom, it's not a good use of resources. And honestly, it'll just turn up trouble that you didn't want to know about. But if you are symptomatic, ultrasound is very good. CT scans are very good. MRI is very good. So talk to your doctor. So she's talking about what are the risk factors for having a stroke that you might identify uh, by blood test. Yeah. So the main things are in keeping with the major risk factors of stroke. So what is your, are you diabetic? What's your sugar? What's your hemoglobin A1C? Are those in normal range? What is your lipid profile? Also very important. Um, those are the kind of tests that most of us will, if we go see our primary care doctor, we'll look into. Um, things about, you know, your heart. Some patients will say, you know, I notice I don't have a normal heart rhythm when I put my finger on my pulse, or I have palpitations, the sense that my heart's skipping a beat. Those are symptomatic things that you're not necessarily going to see by a blood test, but it's similar in terms of identifying a risk factor. So inflammatory markers right now in terms of stroke risk factors is not something that has been widely studied. And it will be interesting to see if uh, that does come out in the future as something that's important. Sorry. When, <coughs> when was TRA developed and how much did it cost? TPA? Or TPA. So 1995 was when it was approved. Um, I'm actually not sure when it was developed before that. TPA. Yeah. And I actually don't know what they charge for it now. I would say that anything what they charge for, it's, it's very hard to know what it actually costs. Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question is, you know, there are a lot of delays if you're going to be someone who's going to get TPA. There are a lot of delays in getting you to a hospital so that you're eligible for the TPA. And, you know, calling a paramedic and ambulance transport 
getting into the ER and being seen and understanding what's going on, those things can add up. And what if that pushes you out of the window where you can get the medication? And so why not just train paramedics to identify stroke and give TPA in the field? Um, that's a very good thought. But I would say there's a few things that we have to make sure we understand. Number one is not everything that looks like a stroke is a stroke. Okay? So seizures can look like a stroke. Low blood sugar can look like a stroke. Intracranial tumors can look like a stroke. A patient who's had a hypertensive hemorrhage in the brain can look like a stroke. And it is important to understand what you're dealing with because although the risk of TPA is relatively low, if you massively expand the number of pa patients that you're going to treat and don't really understand what the diagnosis is, you will hurt a lot of people, particularly patients with tumors that are causing their symptoms or who have already hemorrhaged because you're going to make them bleed more. Um, but people have started to do at what you're asking. So in Europe, for example, they have little vans that have a CT scanner in it and they can drive these mobile stroke units around, scan the patient in the field, have a neuroradiologist interpret the image, give the thumbs up, and they can start to give the TPA in the field. So you can start to think about things like that. Um, but that has been tossed around, but there are those limitations to it. And then just to clarify the numbers, so fewer than 10% of patients are eligible for TPA because of the time constraints. And of the patients that get, t um, patients that get TPA compared to that do not, 30% will have a good clinical outcome and be functionally independent. So the question is, what is sort of the communication between the imaging, the people looking at the imaging, and the neurointerventionist who's going to go and try to get the blood clot? So it's very highly integrated. Um, the people that do these procedures now come from a variety of backgrounds, the most common backgrounds being neuroradiologists like myself, neurologists who are trained in stroke, and neurosurgeons who are trained in stroke through neuroendovascular techniques. So all of those groups are very savvy with neuroimaging. It's very important that we understand the anatomy of the brain. And all those people that do this should have a very good understanding of the brain anatomy, as well as of the vasculature anatomy. The way it works at Stanford, and I don't know how it works everywhere, but I think most places try to do this, when we are made aware of a patient who's being flown in, our team is activated before they arrive. So I'm there at the scanner waiting for the patient to show up. We clinically evaluate the patient. We are there when the patient goes right into the magnet, and we're looking at the images in real time while they're in the MRI or the CT scan. So that interpretation happens by us instantaneously, and we make a decision by the time they wheel out of the scanner, whether we're taking them with us up to the cath lab or whether there's someone that's not likely to benefit from what we have to offer. Other places have, um, you know, they can look at imaging on their phones, at their computers at home. There's a variety of setups. So. As a stroke preventative, can you give us your thoughts on <coughs> blood thinners? If you need one, take it. <laughs> so the question is, what is, what is the thought on blood thinners? So if you have an indication to take a blood thinner and your doctor tells you it's a good idea, then I think it's a good idea. But you got to remember, everything that we do is not without risk. So you know, should we all just take, take an aspirin? Should we all just be on Coumadin to prevent it? Well, a certain percentage of us, and it's not a small percent, is going to have a complication from that. And that could even be bleeding in the brain. And you want to just make sure you have a reason for the medication you're taking, because you are accepting a little bit of risk anytime you put something into your body. The question is, is there a benefit to drinking red wine to clear out the arteries? There are studies that have shown moderate consumption of red wine <laughs> to be good for your cardiovascular health. Um, I do not know the literature on that in terms of stroke prevention. In general, what is good for your cardiovascular health is good for stroke prevention. But I don't know the data as to whether having a glass of red wine a night, what's your you know, decreased stroke risk from that? It's an interesting question. Good question. So there's two parts to the question that's being asked. One is, what are your options if you get to the hospital outside of the time windows that we discussed in terms of treating you because you didn't recognize the symptoms or for some other reason? And the second part of the question is, well, what about if there's a blood clot that's very far away that's not something that's really safe for us to get to from inside the blood vessels? So first off, if you get to the hospital outside of that four and a half hour time window when you can get TPA, we can still offer you treatment from an endovascular perspective. Um, that right now, there are good data for going out to six to eight hours. That being said, most major academic medical centers are now making their decisions based on the imaging profile that I talked about. 
So we have taken patients 12 plus hours out because they get here, we do a scan, they've got a small stroke, they've got a lot of brain at risk, and there's a clot that we can get to. So, and I think increasingly we're gonna start to see more of that. So you do have options. <coughs> Number two, what if you have a small artery that's blocked way out here, what, what can be done? There's a little bit of a gray zone, and I would say you have to be thoughtful. Because what, which artery is blocked? If you come into me and your symptoms are you can't speak because your angular artery is blocked on your dominant hemisphere on the left. That's going to leave you with a pretty significant neurologic deficit. A patient like that, we would actually consider taking to the procedure room and putting a microcatheter into that artery as far out as we can and giving TPA to break up the clot. It's not safe to put a device out to pull the clot out, in my opinion, that far out, but there are options. If it's a smaller blood vessel that maybe your symptoms are less profound, it's a cost benefit. The risk of these procedures is not zero, and maybe the odds of you recovering some function or it not really limiting what you do, you just say, you know what, we're gonna keep your blood pressure in an appropriate place and help you recover. That's a good question. So the question is, uh, among the patients with stroke that come in, what's the breakdown of men and women? So, you know, for, there are many more patients with stroke that come into Stanford than I see. So the patients that we see are the ones who are really sick and have a blood vessel that's blocked that's really close to the brain. I gotta say, for us, it's pretty 50-50. Um, we took care of a gentleman today, and yesterday we took care of a lady. Uh, and that kind of pans out. It's really, it's pretty close to 50-50 now. So, one more, that's it though, before I get yelled at. Go ahead. Uh, some hospitals offer a stroke risk assessment. Does Stanford do that? That's a good question. Nick, are you here? Do you know? I don't, I d I don't know the answer to that. I'm in, uh, in Alameda, mm -hmm. and the hospital there uh, offers that quarterly. So. That's something that we should certainly look into. I don't know that we have a, a clinic that does that. We certainly have doctors that, you know, everyone in our network, if you come in, and see your primary care physician in the Stanford network, you're gonna get asked the questions that are gonna be pertinent to your stroke risk. But someone who, you know, a specific stroke clinic about what your stroke risk is, I don't know if we have that. We can find that out for you. So. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>